Hello everyone, my name is Kurazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world as drifters come out at night to creep and crawl around. Look at that, you are ugly. Wow. I didn't think this was going to be a drifter filled night, but apparently they're having a bit of a fight club over here. Oh no. Look at you boys. A lot of you. Anyway, in the last episode, we started on some preparations for moving to the south, while we also took a look at what the world looks like in 1.17. And boy, does it look good. Now, I want to mention that I have updated to 1.17.3. Last episode, we were on 1.17.2, and it looks like they've fixed some of the issues, like with the square bushes still being here. And I've looked at the patch notes and seen that there are other fixes in this version of the game, which kind of goes without saying. In this episode, I want to do a couple things. There are a few 1.17 things that I want to take a look at again. Uh, one, because we didn't get to pet the animals last time, and I wanted to see that, and some of you pointed out that it might not work in first-person mode. So we're going to try that again. And there are also some preparations we need to put together, and I want to do that while I answer some of your 20 questions that have been submitted in the last, oh, two or three weeks or so. It's been a while since I've done a 20 questions episode. Let's get to it. I'm going to sleep through the night and chase these drifters off, and then we will get started, because boy, is it loud out here. Nighty night. Okay, it is morning, and... Colors are absolutely gleaming. This looks brighter than it did in 1.16. I don't know if it's just my perception of having it be winter, you know, for so long, or something with the fuzzy bushes, or if they've changed some of the shaders and how they interact. Anyway, I want to go and try this petting thing again. Because I was informed there is, in fact... Hello, piggies. You're generation 10, so you're not going to wake up. But supposedly... Since there's no first-person animation, we have to look at this in third-person. Okay, we are doing something. We have our hand on them, and now we're looking at the camera. It's a little weird. What about the sheep? Hello, sheep. So, oh, there we go. We're actually petting the sheep now. Okay, I can dig it. That's cute. And he's just standing there. Or she's standing there. Okay, I can dig it. I think that the lack of a first-person animation at all is a little disappointing. I wish we could see, like, a hand come out and at least move left and right. Well, we can pet the sheep. Anyway, the second thing I wanted to cover is that in between episodes, I did go ahead and make a new shield, a new blackguard shield, because we will need to take one with us when we move south. And I recorded what I did to make it because it is a different process than usual. And you'll see here that it requires, rather than just a plate and a hammer and other things in the grid, it requires a metal boss, specifically an iron boss, which is the rounded thing in the middle of the shield that sticks out. The second thing it requires is gray dye. And gray dye is a bit special. It is made with either rusty gears or the metal scraps in water, and it's a pretty generous recipe. And the reason I say it's unique or really special is that it can then be darkened into black dye by a second application of the scraps or rusty gears. And I made a few pieces of gray leather and put the shield together, and then I went ahead and put more of the pigments in to make black so that we can make some new clothes for heading south. I also finished our red and green dyes and I made some red and green cloth with that. Again, because when we move south, I want to have a different wardrobe. I don't want to take all of these browns with us. You can see that most of our clothing is brown. And I think in the south that might look kind of boring. So I want to take some colorful clothes I'm not quite sure what colors just yet, but I do know that I am tired of these browns and they need to go. 
Granted, we'll be wearing our armor probably most of the time, but that's okay. Next, I want to get together a bin, or a chest, specifically, of all of the things that we are going to take south with us. And I might take two chests to do that, because we're going to have one chest for our chest that we'll be carrying on our back, and one chest to represent our inventory. And I do realize that, you know, a chest is smaller than an inventory, so we might need to expand, but that's okay. So we have chest one, this will be our inventory, and we have chest two, this will be the chest we carry on our back. Into chest one are going to go tools that we are going to need with us on our journey, and as well as things that are vital for life in general. So, a fresh, brand new recurve bow, a brand new axe, and a brand new shovel, a stack of sticks, a stack of terra preta, to get farming started, and a stack of medium fertility soil, mostly for building defenses and temporary shelters with, and 16 honey sulfur pulses with linen. I will just replenish my stock from our adventuring supplies. We will need at least a stack of batters and a stack of linen, and we'll bring our rope ladder with us just in case we need to explore any holes along the way. Add to that a brand new steel pickaxe. And I think that's about it for the things that we have ready to go for our carrying with us chest. Now, in the chest that's going on our backs, I want to bring all of our steel armor. And I may actually move the terra preta over to this chest because we won't need that at all along the way. And same for the linen. I want to bring along a lot of temporal gears. Because even though we might be able to get a lot by farming them, that may take a few episodes to start, you know, building up, and we have a ton of them here, so I'm going to bring as many as I can, or at least as many as I think we'll need. I'm bringing these two sets, or these sets of two, so that we can repair any translocators we find, and I'm bringing these so that we can set our spawn point a couple times along the way, and then once when we get down to where we think our final home is going to be. I'm also going to bring the metal parts that we have, and... I've had some requests for a drifter pit build for farming drifters, especially on temporal storms, and I want to incorporate some metal spikes into it, and they're kind of rare and hard to get because they don't always drop from locust nest areas when you get them, or when you mine them. So I'm going to bring these along for a future build. Back in our with us chest, I'm going to put a full stack of torches, and I will sort of equalize these after or before we leave. So we won't be bringing two stacks of torches with us, just the one. But I want to have all these here so we know what we're going to bring with us. And then I think the last thing that I have that's ready to go is a steel hammer that I just stole from our workshop. And that is that for the things that we have prepared. And apparently it's windy, even inside. That could use some work. Tell you what, there we go. That'll stop us. So the other things I want to bring are things that we need to spend some time making today, and those are things that I'm going to be answering 20 questions over while I work on that. The first is that we need a fresh cooking pot. I don't want to steal any of our house cooking pots, I want to leave them here. And so I'm going to make one fresh one. We need a new steel falx, because ours is pretty new but not brand new, and I want a brand new one. We want to bring along a full stack of arrows, and I'm thinking that steel arrows are the way to go because they have an even lower chance of being destroyed after shooting them than the iron ones do. The irons have a 10% and the steels have a 7%. We'll want to bring along firewood, which I guess I could just go and grab right now. We're going to need an anvil. I'm going to bring along probably an iron anvil, maybe a meteoric iron anvil, just to, you know, be fancy. We're going to keep our current lantern, and I'm not going to put that in the chest because we have that on us all the time. But I do want to change how we do lanterns down in the south. I'm thinking that instead of the Malibu Chacos lanterns, I want to do a different color that's going to work better with our new color palette. I was going to do bismuth lanterns. They're a bit too much, I think, and they won't quite fit the color palette. I decided to go with brass lanterns initially after that, but the brass is a bit dull compared to the tin bronze. Tin bronze is just a nicer, more gold color, whereas the brass looks a bit more burnished. And so I'm going to go with some tin bronze lanterns, and I want to make a full stack of 64 tin bronze lanterns before we go south. 
and bring them all with us so that we never have to make a lantern again. Beyond that, we want to bring enough steel ingots to make probably as many tools as we possibly can more down there, because we're not going to bring all of the tools with us. We're not going to bring a saw with us. We're not going to bring shears. We're going to make those once we get there. So I'm going to bring probably at least two stacks of steel ingots, which would be 32, but I'd prefer to bring a full 64 if we can. And I'm thinking I'm just going to grab that firewood now because, you know, we have it. Let's get some of this. And we're going to bring along one aged wooden bed so that we can sleep through any long nights we might have. And that's going to go in here. The firewood's going to come with us because this is going to be firewood for cooking along the way. You'll notice that I said we're bringing a soup pot and didn't mention any crocs. That's because on long journeys like this, I like to bring just a soup pot and a bowl, and I'll bring a lot of food that lasts a long time in our inventory so that we can cook along the way and not have to worry about dragging along and leaving and wasting a whole bunch of crocs. That being said, I think it's time for us to get to it. So let's go ahead and I'm going to start working on all these projects. It's going to take a little while, I think, but I will answer the latest batch of 20 questions while I work. I'm going to be very busy in the background, but I've compartmentalized my mind enough to be able to answer all these questions, even between all these cuts. Okay, my editor says I should stop joking around now. Anyway, this is the sixth installment of 20 questions. You guys have absolutely filled the queue with great questions, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Let's get started. Our first question is from Ivory Tower. Would you be open to either running or helping create a server that was more focused on the role-playing aspect of Vintage Story? If I could free up some of my time, it's something that I could consider in the future. Though I'd probably have to share the server admin role with at least several other people. To be honest though, there are already some very good community servers out there. I'm a member of RF Fury, for example, and they're going to be starting up their second Vintage Story server very soon. I think their third one as well. I've even seen some groups of people who formed their own little communities in distinct areas of the server, making little towns and such. It's really neat. Our next question is from Ravensfair, who's a repeat offender. What is the funniest thing your cats have ever done, either together or individually? Mew and Rex are both pretty mature cats now, so their days of silly kitten shenanigans are mostly behind them, and both of them have always been pretty chill. I think the funniest things they do are reactions to things that we do. Once upon a time, I got the harebrained idea to put harnesses on them and take them for walks. Mew went completely stiff and fell over on her side, and then got all of her paws stuck in the harness. Rex wore it more proudly, but he was too chicken to go outside. On Rex's part, he is not the most graceful of cats. It's like his front half is cat, and his back half is like a bowling ball loosely attached to his front half with a chain. He is always running into things. I have seen that cat sprint headlong at the stairs, miss the first step, and smack right into it. It makes his whole body accordion, but then he resumes his breakneck sprint without delay or complaint. Our next question is from Tailspinner Games. Which of your many chiseling projects so far has been your favorite or are you most proud of? I think the two I'm proudest of are the Lupine Ridge and Lupine Lodge signs. The Lupine Ridge sign was the result of several hours of work, with some of that in Paint.net designing the pixel layout. The Lupine Lodge sign I'm really proud of because one, I like it, and two, I did it in maybe half an hour, and I just eyeballed the whole thing. It feels really good to realize the development of that kind of eye for fitting things into the constrained areas and using only the materials I have at hand. Our next question is from TJ. Would you consider posting a playthrough of the Wailing Death campaign from Neverwinter Nights or maybe Baldur's Gate 3 when it comes out? Okay, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I have never enjoyed Neverwinter Nights. As much as I enjoyed Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, as well as Icewind Dale 1 and 2, Neverwinter Nights felt empty to me. I think it was a failure of the game to get me to actually care about any of the NPCs, and the lack of any NPC party members and their associated personalities that really made the game boring. Sorry to say, but I was excited for the game when it released, and just felt really let down when I played it. I did have a little fun playing it as a dungeon crashing game with friends, but we mostly ignored the story and just went around blowing fireballs everywhere. It's safe to say that I'm not really interested in Neverwinter Nights. I would be far more likely to play any of the older Baldur's Gate games, or even Icewind Dale. As for Baldur's Gate 3, possibly? I'm going to have to see where the channel is at by then, and we'll have to make some decisions about what I want the channel to focus on. 
So far, it's been 100% vintage stories since I came back to the channel, and I'm leaning towards specializing in indie games and games that just don't get as much spotlight as I think they should. Mainstream games content tends to really saturate YouTube, which is one reason I haven't, and probably won't, make any videos about that other block game. I think Baldur's Gate 3 is still a ways off though, so I'm happy to wait and see until we cross that bridge. Our next question is from Redneck Woman. Do you like to read? If so, what is your favorite book or series of books? I do like to read. My favorite books shift and change constantly, but I generally stick to fantasy with a few science fiction novels here and there. There are a bunch of authors I return to time and again, and I think my two favorite of those are Jim Butcher, who writes the Dresden Files series, and Sarah Ash, whose books and writing I fell in love with in her Tears of Artemon series. I can't really say that I have a single favorite book though. Even when I reread them, each book that I read becomes my temporary favorite, until I read the next one and remember just how fun that book was too. Our next question is from Cloudy Zenith. Do you plan on finding all wood and stone types sometime in the near future, perhaps implementing them in builds whether new or old? Yes, this goes along with our adventure and move to the south. The only stone types we haven't found yet are chalk, white marble, and green marble. I'm not too concerned about any of those, however, and I'm mostly interested in using some of the more colorful and interesting wood types. While finding chalk might be worthwhile, we have plaster to make up for that lack of pure white, and since marble only spawns underground in areas with slate rock, finding marble is not a sure thing. Our next question is from Frito's Bad Act. I'm assuming that is the pronunciation, or it could be Fritos Bad Act. If you were to build a landmark like Stonehenge or something similar, what would your planning process be like? My planning process is flexible and depends largely on two things. How true to the original I want to be, and the scale and or complexity of the build. The second one includes an aspect of just how fancy do I feel like being today. On the lowest end, I might just wing it. I might look at a couple of photos, approximate the circle, and drop some granite on the ground in a rough approximation of the pattern. If it's not a build we'll be looking at often, I might not even chisel it, or only slightly. Some examples of builds that I've winged would be the Starter House and the In-Law Suite, the Greenhouses, Lupine Lodge, the Steelworks Foundry, and the farms, including the landscaping and terraforming. If I'm feeling fancy, I might actually measure out some block distances, probably start a prototype of the base layout in a creative world, and then take some screenshots to use as a guide when building it in survival. I've done this to varying degrees in some builds. The barn, the pottery shack, the blacksmith, and the chicken coop were all mapped out to some extent in a creative world. The barn was one half of the build, the blacksmith was maybe a third, and the chicken coop is the only build that I actually built completely in creative before I built it in survival. Sometimes, especially with larger or more complex builds, if I build them entirely in creative mode, I kind of start to lose the drive to build them in survival. So instead, I'll map them out to scale on graph paper, usually from two or three angles, like front, overhead, or side, before building them in survival. The only build I did this for in this series so far is the main house, including the windmill and the bridge. I try not to go overboard in planning, because so often during the actual building process, I realize that something doesn't work or look the way I wanted it to, like the striped wall on the third floor that is now a solid red color, or I might see something that just works better than the original plan. I like to leave room for me to come in with a chisel and an editor's glee in my eye, and just chisel until the place looks right. Frankly, as I've become more and more comfortable with building a vintage story, I find myself planning less and less, as I become better able to directly translate an idea in my head to blocks in the game. However, I have never started a build without at least a mental image of what the outcome should be. Our next question is from Zini. Would you consider planning a modded series with more mods, perhaps things like wolf taming, cob server exclusives, VS Village, etc.? I have put some thought into future content like that. My main holdups with heavily modded games, though, are these. One, too many mods can make the game glitchy, unstable, or they can interact in unexpected ways that lead to weird things like infinite resource loops. And two, the series could get hard-locked into a specific version of the game and be unable to update if mod goes unpatched for long enough. If I started a modded playthrough at 1.17 and one of the main mods is abandoned, then when 1.18 and 19 come out, my content on the channel could end up feeling quite stale due to missing out on so many new core gameplay features in the vanilla game, as well as in other mods that have been maintained. Both of those reasons are why I like to stick to mods that I can easily add or remove at a moment's notice without having to worry about it breaking my save file. Our next question is actually from Red Deck Woman again. Would you share your computer specs with your viewers? 
Sure. Although I think you got a glimpse of them in the last episode. While I have several gaming computers in the house, the one I'm currently using to play and record Vintage Story is the 2021 model Asus Republic of Gamers Strix G15 Advantage Edition. Whew, that's a long one. It has an AMD Ryzen 9 5900 HX CPU, an AMD Radeon RX 6800M graphics card, 16 gigs of meh DDR3200 RAM, and a one terabyte NVMe solid state disk. It also has a 300 hertz screen with FreeSync, which is what contributes most of the problems I have with recording nice smooth video. It also has enough RGB lights to make Vegas look like child's play. Our last three questions are from Crone22, who has been commenting on my videos since ooh, forever. So thank you for that. When you move south, are you going to do the whole base type? I'm assuming you're talking about building a sort of monolithic base as opposed to multiple locations, like multiple builds. Nothing is set in stone as of yet, but I am thinking of building a more monolithic style base in the south, rather than our current multi-structure base. I think it would be nice to be able to move seamlessly between all of our functional centers without having to run outside into the rain and drifters. The second question is, are we going to see Lupine Ridge again? I can't really say yet whether we'll come back to build a lot more on Lupine Ridge, but we will definitely revisit our home here before the end of the series, even if it's just to burn down that stupid redwood tree when it grows up to be tiny again. And the last question is, are you going to pick a different flower to decorate with in the south? I think we might have to. I'm pretty sure lupines don't generate much once you get into the warmer climates, so we'll have to find something else. I might have to bring a stack or two of blue lupines though, since I seem to recall a distinct lack of blue options from the last time I visited the Deep South. Though that might entail a trip back to Lupine Ridge after our initial departure due to inventory constraints. As for what we'll pick to be our main feature, you'll have to wait and see. I've been working on a new build style for the Deep South, and I can't wait to share it. Well everyone, that is the end of the current stack of 20 questions that have been sitting on my, well, desk on my laptop for a while. Thank you all to everyone who submitted questions, and if you want to submit a question for me to answer in a video like this one, put it in a comment with the hashtag 20Questions. That's enough of me yammering, so let's get back to what we're doing and talk about what we're working on. Well, well, well. It looks like we may have found our very first bear. He is, um, very mean in going after my animals. And I do not appreciate that one bit. So I hear these guys are pretty darn tough. So let's um, pepper them with arrows. Ooh, 10 arrows. Yikes. Well, there's our bear. And she spawned, like, right over here. Great. They have decent drops, I guess, for, well, maybe not for the trouble, but three huge raw hides, two lumps of fat, three bones, and 11 bush meat in a decent weight black bear. Okay, with that ugly business put to rest, to rest, that reminds me, we have a very belated update to make. I need to get something to write with and some glass. Be right back. So it's been a while since we've been to the cemetery, but it is time that we revisit it to finally put to rest. All right, that's the dead wolf. To finally put to rest GG Beyond. This is a somewhat belated burial, but I've kind of been neglecting this whole place for a bit, so whoopsie. Regardless, GG Beyond made it through their entire in-game year of Vintage Story without a single death. Which is good, because that would have ended the world, since they're playing in hardcore. So it is with both heavy and light hearts that we put GG Beyond to rest with three pieces of glass, to represent the enormous amount of glass that they built their house with. In you go. Stay there. And we are also going to update the sign by throwing all our coal at it. GG Beyond lived happily ever after. And that is the end of their story. Now I guess we aren't going to be able to come back here and 
bury anybody else for a while, but we do still have four graves, so we'll keep those in mind for later. That will freak me out again. I should just clear these up. Goodbye. Anyway, let's get back to business. There are a couple things I want to do while we're still waiting for our onions to grow so we can make some yellow dye. And one of them is I want to bring as many rusty gears with us as we can. I'm not sure how high they stack. I think they go higher than 128. But I want to bring as many as we can so that if we have to buy anything down south, we can. Now currently we have 116 rusty gears. But I think we can get a few more if we take a few gems with us. And we can go and visit the artisan trader just up here. While we're on the way here, I did want to note that there is one really nice fix in 1.17 that has been bothering me for ages. Notice how, from afar, the grass no longer has that sort of weird glow that often made me mistake things on the horizon that weren't actually there. So, when the grass was drawn at a distance, using what's called an LOD, it was sort of creating this extra sort of glow on the horizon, and boy, would it trip me up all the time. Hello, artisan in the corner on your pile of gears. Are you a Scrooge McDucking over here? What do we have? Oh, we have Seraphim. I think we need to send our third, don't we? I'm taking it. I don't care. I'm taking it. Oh, he's getting 14 gears for a low potential emerald. Yes, please. He is loaded with gears. He's not giving much for the high peridot, so I'm going to just leave that one alone. But I will give him my medium and my low. And he wants a medium diamond, which I do not have. So I think that is a pretty good deal. We can finish this tapestry. We can hang it up. Oh, that's neat. That's pretty. Mm. Yep, sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just what I needed. Yes. Okay, so rusty gears do stack higher than 128. I wonder how high they do go. Anyway, let's get this back home and put that tapestry together. Time to see if we got the right one, and we did. Okay, left third, center third, and right third. We don't have all of Rot. I don't think that one gets sold. Let's put our gems back. There we go. And let's go find some places to put these. I am thinking that this vessel could go maybe here. Or is it crowding this too much? Maybe. We put you somewhere else. Would you fit in here? Possibly there, although I don't like it against the white so much. Hmm. Maybe this belongs in a different building. As far as this tapestry goes, could be put in... no, not there. Not against the ceiling. Probably can't go here. Upstairs somewhere. Nope. I am really not sure where to put this. There really isn't quite anywhere that really fits what I'm looking for, as far as having a three block wide tapestry goes. So I think for now we'll try putting it up here. I'm not a wild fan of having it against the wall over here. Burn. And we got the lore or a seraphim. Let's take a quick peek at that one. Number 12, seraphim. To think we would have a chance to fight again. I do not know why we are returned to this world, but I am grateful. Interesting. So, the seraphim, that's us, are aware of this sort of returning to the world when we die, it sounds like. Either that, or maybe we went far away, dimensionally, and now we're back. Who knows? What I do know is that this tapestry would fit perfectly right here. It does mean 
We would need to move that lantern, but I'm not sure that's a problem. Let's go ahead and move this tapestry to where it needs to go. There we go. That's better. And I guess we can probably put the lantern here. Even though I don't think we need the light, but I'm going to put it here anyway. And I think that this vessel needs tow. We already have one. Okay, I'm going to put this vessel in storage for now, and we will figure out what to do with it later. Which might mean leaving it here for a year, or three, or however many. Okay, the next chore I have is we need to milk the sheep. We don't really need to, but I kind of want to make some cheese pies. And we're getting kind of low on cheese. In you go. And in you go. There we go. And the next thing I want to do is I want to make some bread to go and try to sell to the treasure hunter trader that is near us. And so I'm going to make 40 of each kind of bread, just in case. And we are going to go and do that probably tomorrow. So, let's get some firewood. All of it. Let's do the thing. Well, I'm going to be here probably all night making bread, so I'll see you all in the morning, and we are off to go and see what the treasure hunter has for us. And that better be gears. Okay, we are... Oh, hey, there's fish here. Okay, so they are spawning. Well, I guess the bear kind of showed us that things are spawning in new places. That's a really small pond to support four salmon, but you know what? I don't question it. Also, don't salmon live in the rivers and oceans, not lakes and ponds and stuff? Maybe they're just carp masquerading as salmon. Anyway, we have a bunch of stuff. I have all the bread I promised. I also grabbed a recurve bow and a long bow to see if we can sell to them. And at this point, I'll probably take any price. We have not sold many of those bows. So even if they're kind of a meh price, I'll still take it. Anyway, I will see you there and we'll see what our treasure hunter has. Okay, we are closing in on our destination, and how are you, Roy? Roy? Okay. You have a decent number of gears, actually. And you have scrolls. You have three of them. All right. Sign me up. Sign me up. And that backy shirt actually might be the yellow I'm looking for. I may have to buy that from you, buddy. Yeah, yeah hang on, hang on, hang on. I got your stuff for you. Jeez. Pushy, pushy. You want that many rye bread. You want just as many spilt bread. Disappointed, and really, three for each of them. We actually have decent prices for both the bows, so I'll take that. And I want to buy these. We're going to read the scroll. We got the morning, part five of five. Let's buy one more scroll. We got Brief Discussions with the Traveler, part two of four. And we got Brief Discussions with the Traveler, part three of four. Wow. So it looks like we are still not done with these scrolls and the lore. Just the books we can get from panning. All right. Well, let's get going home and let's start wrapping up our chores. Hopefully those onions are grown by now. And... If not, I will continue pounding out iron ingots from blooms and firing more steel, just in case we're going to take some more with us. And I'll bring you all back when those onions are ready. Okay, so it has been like four days, and I've been checking these onions like crazy, and they are just taking forever to grow now. And I did check the onion seeds, and... They say they take 16.6 days to grow, but I don't think that's accurate because, I mean, it's only been, I don't know, eight or nine. 
and they're at least grown. So I'm not sure what the deal is with that. We do have one or two that aren't ready yet, so we'll leave them. Let's go ahead and... Wait, whoa! Uh... Thirteen onions from... What is going on? What? That's a lot of onions. That's... That does not seem right. <laughs> that does not seem right at all. But I will take it, I guess. That is a ton of onions. Oh. My. Goodness. Are these the same way? Nope. Still get two. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave the rest of the cabbage because I want them to be as fresh as possible. And if we leave them in the ground until we leave, or right before we leave, they will stay fresher longer because their spoil timers don't kick in until we harvest them. So, that was a good experiment, though. I'm not sure why the onions are so prolific. That is weird. Are these guys the same way? Oh, yeah. I guess I'll be harvesting a whole ton of rye and the rest of the onions first, so I'll see you down in the dying room after I empty all my pockets of rye seeds. All right, let's get to the dying part. And I want to do two barrels of yellow dye because one, I want to turn into orange dye. And in order to do orange dye, it's kind of like the gray to black where you have to do the gray dye first and then you use the same materials to make the black dye. So gray dye to black was either rusty gears or metal scraps. And yellow to orange is onions and onions. So that's how it's done. Let's go ahead and we're going to put 48 onions in each of these. It's a one to one ratio. So we're going to do that and that. And we'll come back after eight hours and see how they're doing. I got a ridiculous amount of everything. We ended up with three, four, almost five stacks of onions. I threw out most of the rye. And over here, I harvested the flax, and I didn't even turn it all into twine yet, but this is how much flax we got. And figure that each of these is basically two stacks of flax fibers, so I'm going to report a bug, because that sounds ridiculous. I mean, the onions were exploding out of the ground at us in our faces, so yeah, that's weird. Let's check back in once our orange and yellow dyes are both done, because it is time to start making us some clothes. Some southerly clothes. Alright, let's check out... Yes, we have yellow and orange cloth in the exact numbers we need. So, let's go and start putting some clothes together because I've had a look in mind. I don't know if it'll work or not, but we're going to find out. And we're going to need all of these, I think... And we're going to need some of these, and I think we'll need some leather as well. That'll probably do. So, I wanted to make a few things. One is a pair of fine trousers. So, let's go ahead and make that. Fairly simple. There we go. Nice, fine, dark trousers. And then, I wanted to... Oh, wrong button. I wanted to make a cobalt mantle. So, let's put these in here. And like that. And cobalt mantle. And then I wanted to do a traveler's earth rope to get some more of that yellow in our outfit. If it works. If it doesn't, then whatever. Then, for our feet, I wanted something colorful initially, but I decided against it in the end. And I think we're just going to go with the high leather boots. There we go. Let's try this on and see how we look. Okay, on go the boots. On go the pants, which I know is the wrong order to dress in. Let's put the shirt on next. And the cobalt mantle. Does that... Oh. 
Oh, the cobalt mantle is the shirt. Okay. Well, you know what? I kind of like it. I think this is us. I mean, we got the short sleeves going on. And we got some stylish pants. There aren't any shorts in the game, so that's fine, though. And those boots look pretty good on this, too. I think we'll go for it. And if we're feeling extra fancy... Oh, that's a big pair of pants in my vision. Feeling really extra fancy. I was panning for a while earlier, and I picked up this silver diadem. Now, this might just look silly, but... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. No, I look too much like a... I don't know. Magical girl anime kind of thing. Not quite the look I'm going for. We will just put you back, but that's fine. Oh, there you are. Now, for a belt, I don't like this sturdy belt. It's very plain, and I'm not really certain that we need a belt. But I do have one that I might want to try, and it is right up here. And you. How do you look? Oh, there we go. You know, I don't... Mm, no, I don't think we need a belt, because we have this sort of mantle, sort of like an open jacket kind of thing. I wouldn't want to wear a belt over top of that, so we'll just leave that. I think we will leave the Traveler's Earth Robe behind as well. Well, everyone, that is about all the time we have for this episode of the Vintage Story Guide. We have about two more days, in-game days it is, until our meat is finished curing, and then we'll be off, because we are fully packed aside from our food. I hope you're looking forward to our big adventure and settling in new lands. And if you have any questions you want me to answer in a video like this one, drop them in a comment with the hashtag 22questions. And if you play computer games and want to support the channel, consider using my partner link next time you're shopping on the Humble Store, on screen now and in the description below. Anyway, as always, my name has been Corazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.